And now finally we're ready. All right. Well, welcome everybody here at Tampere office and everybody online. My name is Suvi Helen and co-hosting with Mira Reilama. Everyone for this evening, I hope you have everything you need you have had snacks here at the office you've had some refreshments and i think everybody who's online are comfortable with our uh roughly a little less than two hour program we have on our agenda today first these welcome words and a few practicalities and then with Amu Terhi and Sarah, we were introduced different topics about accessibility and different point of views. At the end, we have a panel discussion with our wonderful guests today, hosted by Mira. And, and for the panel, we would need your help. We would like you, you to input your question to the panelists. And online, you should have a link to a Google form where you can place as many questions as you you can think of. And here, uh, on, on we have QR code for the form. So whenever you come up with something you would like our panelists to to answer, then submit your question. And after the we here at the office still some mingling and and snacks if there are any left. So uh, with further ado, Mira, you want to say something first? <laughs> Yes, I can introduce myself as well. So my name is Mira Reilam and uh, I'm really happy to be here with you guys learning about this super important topic. From, I have to say and our amazing speakers. Uh, we have three speakers and first up we have Amu Urhonen. Amu uh, is a, a Finnish disability rights activist, the chair of Abilis Federation and has been working with accessibility issues uh, within Finland, internationally, for NGOs and for the public sector as well. Um, for AMU, accessibility is a human right and we're so happy to hear from her. As the first speaker, welcome. Hello, my name is Amo, and it's really nice to be here. And it was easy to come here because I live in Tambella, very, very uh, short trip to here. Um, as uh, um, as you heard, I'm a disability rights activist. I have worked for uh, different NGOs and also um, international. Uh, Federation of the Red Cross and the city of Tampere. So I have a lot of um, experience of of accessibility as a topic. I also have a lot of uh, experience about this work personally because I'm a wheelchair user. And uh, let me tell you, I, this is something that I have to deal with like every day. Today I'm going to talk about uh, accessibility in very general terms. I'm not going to go into um, technical details or anything like that. Uh, if you want to talk to me about that or with me about that, then it's okay. we can do that afterwards. But because I only have such a short time, I thought maybe uh, we can Okay, maybe it's better to talk about why accessibility is so important. I and I kind of hope that uh, all of this will be obvious for you, and that I wouldn't have to have speeches like this. But because unfortunately, I know that that is not the case for most people. That's why it's maybe a good idea to at least uh, go through all of those reasons again. Okay. Uh, the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. I'm going to 
talk about disabled per person and not persons with disabilities, but uh, this is an academic debate. Anyway, the, the convention says very clearly that accessibility is a human right. Yes, and this is what we need to know. Accessibility is a human right, and therefore alone it's something that we have to take care of. But, uh, uh, but it's not only a human right in itself, it also ensures many other human rights that makes other human rights come true, such as equality. It's really, really important to make sure that, uh, that this world will be equal to everybody. Uh, people have a right for social relations, you know, friendship, meeting other people. Accessibility is also needed there. It's important for that so that people can work. It's important for uh, housing so that people can choose where they live. We all have a right, a legal right to choose where we want to live and how we want to live. But if we, uh, there are no accessible buildings, it, it's not the same for everybody. It's also a matter of safety. Uh, recently, I have been working a lot with uh, war, uh, war issues, because that Abil is it, uh, that it actually a foundation of the Federation. Uh, Abil is, uh, is giving aid to Ukraine because uh, the, the, the organizations of uh, disabled people in Ukraine. And we have noticed that a lot of the problems that they have at the moment during the war, the, during the times of war, actually are a result of that the accessibility hasn't been taken care of in the times of peace. Now it's escalating. So making sure that um, societies are accessible is actually uh, a pair of uh, a really big part of preparation for crisis and conflicts. Unfortunately, this is the case. Uh, it's uh, accessibility also is needed to ensure health and family life and so on. I would say there is an accessibility angle to all human rights issues. But these are just examples. Well, uh, accessibility is a lot of things. I often hear that. Why do you only talk about ramps and why do, uh, like only about physical dis uh, disability is physical accessibility? Well, right now I'm going to do that because I don't have enough time to talk about the the uh, variety of the dimension of accessibility as much as I would like. And I have and uh, <laughs> looking at the program, you will hear about that from. Uh, speakers today, but I want to remind you that there are also other dimensions like psychological, social, a, a little bit depending also about the definition. Uh, digital uh, accessibility is very important, especially on the uh, times that we live. We can also talk about normative uh, legal point of accessibility, there are economical points. And <laughs> I often hear people saying that, well, it's all about attitudes, and we, that all we need, we, we need to improve our attitudes. Well, and, uh, to some extent, that is a good idea to talk about attitudes, but unfortunately, Attitudes will not turn uh, steps into an elevator, so we need something else as well. But, oh, but on the other hand, attitudes can make uh, 
a completely accessible uh, place, completely inaccessible. If you use it in a wrong way, or if you make some stupid rules or something like that. So attitudes have to do with uh, this, but they will not solve the whole thing. I want to point out that when I'm talking about human rights, there is, well, written with, with uh, capitals, human rights could be like legal, a matter of law, and then there is this human right that happen that we activists do and that everybody must do that to talk about what is wrong and what is right. And that happens all the time. And when you think about uh, human rights as, as that kind of uh, human thing, you also understand that it's a process that, does, that never ends. It's something that you have to think about all the time. And this also applies to accessibility. It's a constant struggle, struggle, I could say. And, and also I have to say about human rights that they are only the minimum level. We can and we should be doing better all the time. Human rights are universal and they belong to everybody. I want to point out this just to make sure that everybody understands that um, accessibility is a right even when it does not serve the majority. Because I often hear that people say that, well, this is, all, this is such a good thing also for elderly people and also for non-disabled people and also for people with uh, 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 child carriage plans. Why don't I know the English word? Well, anyway, you know what I mean. People who have little, little children. Uh, but there are also dimensions of accessibility that that do not benefit the majority like at all if you think about rail rail you know uh, that doesn't benefit anybody but the blind person who needs to uh, know which floor they are going on the elevator and they need rail to to do that and they, it has to be it is their right, even when it does not benefit uh, other people. And so we, we, we should never justify acceptability by saying that this is so good for everybody. And also, human rights are something that cannot be taken away simply. Here is a picture of two wheelchair users trying to reach uh, uh, ATM, like a cash vending machine. They cannot do that because uh, there are two steps and it's outside. And I'm showing you the picture because this is a legal situation in Finland. Uh, it's because it's outside. There is a law about accessibility uh, inside a supermarket. This is a wall of a supermarket in Kittila. But there is no law saying that also the outside, the wall, the something that is attached in the wall should be accessible. And Finland actually opposed uh, the EU directive that would have solved this problem and that would have made this kind of arrangement illegal. This is legal in Finland. That's why we need to do better than the law. Something that irritates me deeply uh, this, is a, uh, this is a picture of the restaurant cart 
of the uh, of a train in uh, their train in Finland. It's a quite new a new uh, restaurant cart. And well, the, the picture is not very clear, but there is a handle uh, in between an aisle or in the middle of an aisle that goes uh, very uh, close to the, uh, to the cashier line. Um, they are deliberately decided to place this kind of an obstacle to their restaurant carts and make it inaccessible. And this may be not legal, but they haven't removed those handles. And we have been talking about this like for seven years, and even the European Commission had actually uh, talked about this because it might be legal or this might not be legal. We don't know yet because the European Commission is right now making their uh, stand. And the problem is that even if it would be illegal, there are no sanctions. So accessibility legislation in Finland that is quite poor is not followed because there are no sanctions. We need a better law with sanctions. I, 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 and I, I, I travel by train a lot. As the as people who know me, they know that I use trains a lot, and this really pisses me off. And my my final picture is from abroad. Well, actually, I'm doing pretty much the same thing here as as she's doing in the picture. There is a woman uh, in a wheel uh, a wheelchair user showing a power. And uh, the law in Finland doesn't require this kind of a situation where where a person can actually do their job. I mean, I work for the, at the moment I'm working for a project that happened in the University of Helsinki, and <laughs> I know some of my work also contains teaching. But if I try to look for, uh, and if I try to look for uh, um, a, a room where to teach, the um, the system of Helsinki University uh, will, uh, if I pick a box like I want an accessible room. It will give me also rooms that have steps to the place where I'm supposed to teach. It's only accessible for the, the, the students. But this is also legal in Finland, unfortunately. And no wonder that wheelchair users are one of the most discriminated group of, of, of um, people who Employ, uh, who uh, seek uh, uh, employment. There, there are studies showing, and it's very approved, just because they use a wheelchair. I'm looking for a, a job at the moment. This is very depressing for me. But anyway, we would also need, I mean, you, uh, work is also a human right, and we are not following that. Uh, if you go to Germany, for example, they have a really good law about this, and they also have quotas to make sure that disabled people are hired. So this could be done better. Well, uh, my point is what, what we want to do with accessibility is inclusion, not exclusion. That is the first, that is like maybe my dystopia, my, you know, worst case scenario. And not segregation, where some people are put there in their own world. But it's not possible, actually. There are no separate worlds. There's no B, like they say. Uh, and I, and well, 
I don't need integration. When I go to movie, I would like to sit with my kids and not in the uh, uh, in the place that it reserved for the uh, wheelchair users. And then, uh, the, but that's the case. That's what I have to do. And to be on a, the to, to be a bit critical, I have to say that those wheelchairs are always on the worst possible position of the movie theater. Take a look when you go to the movie theater so the next time. Horrible. But what I would like and what we need and what this Human Rights Convention also uh, reach for is inclusion so that everybody be living in the same society and therefore we need to say change the society and not trying to make you know what is also not seen in my in this uh, otherwise great picture is that also integration kind of uh, implies that those colorful dots i mean red and blue and yellow dots should be changed somehow become norm like to feel some norm and become more green and then they could move into the world with the rest of the greens there's no party politics here by the way and uh, 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 but yeah in uh, in the inclusive world we we, we could all live in a world without um, without any boundaries and just as we are we could all work we could all benefit this society we could uh, all live full lives that's my goal and that's the goal of accessibility as well we, that's what we could do with accessibility so i think my time is up but, uh, and we we will have a chance to talk after this. But if you uh, feel a need uh, to to ask anything, please email me. And uh, or uh, that's my social media account uh, address also that you can use if you feel like you want to contact me. If you have any questions or anything, I will be happy happy to talk with talk to all of you so later thank you very much for your attention thank you um so next up uh we need to do some mic changing uh and in the meantime if you have any questions for amu uh you are very welcome to add them in the uh, form there's uh, if you're here live there's uh qr codes and the link is on the tables um and we will ask them at the q a panel yes okay so next up we have um, Madonna mic setting here. <laughs> um, while while they get set up, I'll introduce. So, next speaker we have is is Terhi Manninen, and Terhi is <laughs> trying to get get a mic mic on. Um, she works. At the digital accessibility as a digital accessibility specialist we're getting some help <laughs> trying to getting mic set up mm. Madonna has has a team to do this I think <laughs> Okay. All right. Okay. So, 
pois. En mä tiedä, saanko sata. Okei, okay. okay. we're set up. <laughs> Welcome on stage, Thank you. Uh, where should I stand? Okay. Well, hello. Uh, I have no idea what time is it, so 15 minutes. Ah, so I was here last year, October time. I was talking about accessibility back in then, and I gave some homework for people. I have no idea if people are actually doing anything what I asked them to do, but I, I see some people here, so I kind of know that they are doing something. So um, those who haven't met me before, I have some homework for you today, so please look forward to that one. Can you actually hear me? Yeah? Good. Um, so the topic, accessibility and positive sighted people. Well, I'm from Finnish Federation of Visual Impaired, so I thought it mm, should be quite a good topic. Um, because people usually think about accessibility and blind people and free readers and all that sort of thing. But there are other things that do affect people. Um, especially partially sighted people. If we go then to the definition, what does it mean that someone is partially sighted? It means that their vision, their eyesight has been reduced so much that it cannot be corrected anymore, so with a surgery or like a glasses. So I still have eye glasses, so I'm fine, but it's just one of those things that optician will say, okay, this can't be corrected anymore or you might have some kind of like a uh, uh, disease that causes you to lose the eyesight somewhat or completely so it's it's something that you know happens and you would think is it rare well not really um according to the uh, european union there are around um more than 30 million people across europe who, ha who are blind uh, or partially sighted. So it's quite a large number. Think about Finland. Um, according to stats uh, by the Finnish Register of Visual Impaired, there are around 55,000 people who have severe impairment, and 73% of those people are partially sighted. Also, the word low vision is used. So it's quite high if you think about it. So what people use if you are partially sighted? So screen magnifiers, zoom, so you can use the browser and zoom in things. Um, also a screen reader or narrator or some type of reader to help you. And I know that my colleagues, if they have to read a long document, they want to use a screen reader or narrator to read the document for them. And I know also that people who still have eyesight want to use it as long as they can. So they want to use magnifying classes and that kind of things in order to get by rather than switch immediately to screen readers. So there's a bit of like a jump then to trying to take a new technology on board again. So Sometimes when you're between, you might struggle. But yeah, there are things, and I think, uh, well, the more things are kind of advancing, the more there are aids that people can use. Think about what problems then partially sighted people encounter and what you can do about them. This is not an exhaustive list not by me any means because I'm talking about now some of the things. I wanted to highlight my favorite thing, low contrast. Uh, I don't know why this is so common because this is one of the most easiest things to fix. However, that is something that you encounter almost on every website that is not required to be accessible. Uh, it's it's amazing that you, you can find this almost everywhere. But yeah, it's it's a problem if you can't read the text. Uh, so example here, a light gray text on a white background. I love it. It's so minimalistic. It's so zen, but you can't read it. Oh, no. Um, 
how to fix, obviously, use a, some kind of color contrast analyzer to check. So don't just rely on your eyesight because you can't see perfect, perfectly, the other person can't. Uh, I know that if you're working with the client project, they have some annoying brand colors and they have to keep them. And you're thinking like, what can we do? And then you just have to kind of like be firm and say, well, okay, how about we use this and this? Be more creative how you use the colors. Don't be like, oh, you can't use our print colors anymore. Uh, but yeah, what can you do differently? Maybe they be like accent colors somewhere. Brand colors typically are used on heading text elements and then they cause problems. Oh. One of the things uh, that will affect people, lack of scalability. Uh, so things are not responsive. So uh, it can be really hard to read the text or navigate the website if you're trying to enlarge the page, but the layout just doesn't doesn't want to do anything uh, with that enlargement. So things become distorted. You can't see the elements anymore. Things disappear. It's all a mess, and things might overlap and become even unreadable. Or elements, like uh, in one public website I was looking at the other day, uh, the chat icon, what they have, is just so stupidly large compared to the content I want to read. And it's like, what? And they also have this kind of narrow um, arrow thing that you can use to get to the top of the page. Again, it just takes too much space of the page. And I think they have kind of everything almost spot on, but they haven't thought about this at all. But it can affect the person who wants to read the page. And uh, the topic is quite hard anyway, so they might struggle anyway. So obviously, use responsive design, make sure that, you know, everything is optimized and, you know, uh, or what I counted in code the other day, there's, um, I have an Android phone, Chrome uh, browser, I was looking at the travel agent website. I can't get past the cookie web cookie notice at all. It just stays there. There's no buttons that I can press away. So I, I can't book a travel uh, trip anywhere. Um, inconsistent design. This is something that um, you might more uh, encounter when using mobile apps. It's just sometimes hard to, when you have so much stuff that you want people to do, it's sometimes hard to make it like uh, nice and clean and easy to understand. But it is really a, a problem when uh, you, you can't really understand where things are anymore. And when you have that site that you have to enlarge the things. It's really a struggle to try and to find Where's this navigation menu? And you can say almost here the, the other element of the design when it's cluttered or when there's too much going on on a website. Um, I'd be text everywhere, like here, 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 here. Where am I supposed to read the thing? Am I now missing something because I'm just reading this bit? But then there's something here as well on my left hand side. What's going on? So design, I don't know, you, you probably need so much user feedback from real users telling you, oh, this doesn't work. Because I think if actually that feedback were gathered regularly, things wouldn't be as bad. What can you start today? I, I gave some homework and this is just a reminder for you. And I, I think hopefully this rings a bell. For you. Um, last time I asked you to be the ambassador of the revolution, I'm sure you're doing this already. And um, if this is the first time you hear me talking about this, this is my task for you, start the revolution. Um, with your current job role, you probably have some responsibilities. So what can you do to make sure that accessibility is there? And making sure that, you know, the client projects, can you push access to being part of the work or not. 
I know it can be a struggle when it's a client who doesn't have to abide with the uh, accessibility legislation. Uh, trying to get the testing done in properly so that you don't get the effect where you can see that something has been tested with a screen reader, but then not like with a keyboard. So it kind of tells you that this is not like a properly thought how things are done. And keep keep learning and arrange training, you know, get, get people around you excited about the topic. It's hard and you have to kind of like keep going and, you know, with a new legislation happening, it's constantly that you have to just keep going. Ah, mm. my bonus is go beyond the uh, web content accessibility guidelines. We know that it's the minimum. So at least start with that one. But you know, it's, it's not really everything. And uh, the problem is, it doesn't really guarantee the good user experience, unfortunately. So you can have technically accessible sites, but then user experience is quite bad, say so mobile applications. So you have to kind of go beyond. So that's my bonus. So if you are advanced already, just try go beyond that. Bonus two, customer experience. I mean, it should be a given successful experience it is the thing that i as a person a want to do abc it should be you know 24 7 365 i have my application i can do this like la, la, la. so it shouldn't be a problem that someone is like oh i can't do this because my screen reader doesn't work or the you know the enlargement doesn't work or whatever that problem is so you know keeping that customer truly in focus and trying to get your client to understand that in order they have to have happy customers, you need to take clients into account and create that successful, successful experience. That's my talk for today. If you have any questions later, let me know. Thank you. All right, thank you, Terhi. Okay, again, if you have any questions for Terhi, uh, here I put the um, QR code and the link. Uh, it will be going around the room, and if you're online, just pop over to the link and uh, add your questions there. There he has a background both in both programming and, and design, so she knows what he's talking about. Okay, next up we have Asra. And Asra is an accessibility specialist who's currently working for Kofora. Um, and her background is in computer science and programming, and her own personal experience with assistive technology has helped her in her role uh, for the past uh, over six years. Uh, let's just get her set up here. One moment. You can use this time to think of very hard questions to ask at the panel for all of our speakers. Just one moment where I'll fix a bit of a technical issue here.
Yes. I don't see any slides yet, so. <laughs> Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone from uh, my side as well. Uh, and uh, first of all, I just want to apologize for those who are watching online. I have no idea where the camera is. So if I'm not looking properly, uh, bear with me. I'm, I can't see at all. So I'm just move my head around and just pretend that I'm seeing people who are around here. But uh, I'm at, uh, and I'm working as an accessibility specialist for a company called Gofor here in Finland. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I like, the, I have this photo of me here in the slides uh, and uh, which I, at some point, I gave it to uh, this seeing AI app and to see that what's there. Because, you know, these days people, it's, it has become a nice trend that people kind of describe themselves when they have a presentation that, you know, who they are, how they look like and, and so on. And uh, so I was just like, okay, how am I going to describe myself? So I gave my photo to this seeing AI uh, application uh, to see what it says. And I was very happy because it guessed my 10 years early, uh, le uh, less than I really am. So, uh, yeah, I'm 30 something year old and uh, uh, I have a black, well, black hair with a lot of gray in it and uh, um, I'm relatively short compared to average Europeans, I would say. Uh, and yeah, I. Uh, just wanted to start, I don't know if I'm in the right slide. I hope I pressed too many, but I'm, uh, I wanted to start with a little background about me. So as I said, I'm totally blind. I haven't been blind always. I loved listening to Terhi right now here because it just brought so many memories of uh, my experiences before. So until 12 years ago, when I lost the rest of my eyesight, I was partially sighted. And I used to use the uh, screen magnifications. At some point, I started using a screen reader next to a screen magnification because just the experience of reading was getting harder and harder. And then at some point, then I couldn't use my sight uh, uh, anymore at all. So then I switched totally to a screen reader. I'm originally from Iran. I was born and raised there. Uh, 2013, I moved to Finland to do my uh, master's degree here in computer science. I already did my bachelor in Iran software engineering and tried to find a job. Uh, my dream was to be a developer, but I don't know if it's a surprise or not. Nobody wanted a blind developer. Nobody wanted to hire a blind developer. I moved to Finland with the hope that things would be better here. So I did my master in computer science. And unfortunately, although many were much better. Nobody still wanted to hire me as a developer. I had several interviews like that. I passed the first steps of a job uh, searching. And then when I got to the interview, they just like, no, we, have, we use so many pictures. We can't hire a blind person. 
And uh, so I, uh, finally, I started uh, in a startup uh, as a as an accessibility specialist was very new. The field was very new in Finland. Together, kind of like read a lot of material with with uh, my boss who started the company, and the years learned a lot. Uh, worked on, on my own experiences and what I knew about uh, programming and what I knew about you know experiences of as a partially sighted person. What I knew about now is experiences of a screen reader, and uh, you know just uh, grew more and more in this field. And then I said recently moved to go for a uh, for a bit of more challenges. <laughs> but uh, so it is. Uh, the, the topic that I'm talking about is just something that I have been always dealing with. But I wanted to, because this this idea of like, I'm I'm a person of this society and I have studied, I have worked hard for what I know and I have wanted to get a job that I have a dream. I love my job right now, but I did have it and I still love to code. Coding is my dream. And the fact that nobody would, and, and there is a still very, very few um, developers who are blind, who are being hired. It's, a, it's still a fact in many countries, including uh, Finland and, and other European countries. In the slide about it, I, I need to say that. Uh, if For those of you who don't know Finnish, the porkana means carrot. So that's the things that my, my guide Helmi likes it's people petting and and porkana. Can I play? I don't know if you remember ever asking this question as a child. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Please. Uh, do you remember ever asking these questions? Do you remember being in a situation when you wanted to play with the other kids and ask them like? Can I play? I don't know if you have ever had the experience of being excluded. I do have a lot of that experience. As a partially sighted uh, girl, whom most of the people around me didn't really understand the things that I can do and things that I cannot do, I was many, many times excluded from games. And, you know, like they just like, oh, you can't run like us, so we are not going to include you and so on. So this was lot of my childhood experience. Uh, I was recently, I teared up recently reading about this topic in this uh, the book called Mismatch, uh, that, you know, got that this experience that, that we start from the very early childhood, uh, when as soon as we start like playing with the other kids, thinking that, can I be part of this? Can I join you? And Many, many kids around the world with disability experience the exclusion, this exclusion, the exclusion that comes from people's and behavior, but also exclusion comes from the tools and environments, like a, a playing ground that is not accessible for a kid who is using a wheelchair or for his parents. And for me, you know, I'm still a child. I, that I have been like for years have been waiting to be grown up and it hasn't come yet. I've always thought that the 35 year old should be a grown up, but no, no news yet. So, uh, and, and, and for me being a, like, as a person who is very passionate about work, who's very passionate about groups together, a group of people who are in one company working for the same thing. This is a play. This is a game. This is a game that we are into. Together. And I want to play. I want to be part of this. So I'm still asking this question. Can I play? Uh, I'm not here that I have all the answers. I have just in my company recently got more the chance uh, to work on this topic. So here are some of the, the, the ideas and thoughts that I'm going to work toward in, uh, in my company and hopefully together with others company as a, uh, as a um, shared uh, interest. So when we talk about the accessible workplace, there are three main areas that 
think about. There are definitely, there are a lot of things to be included in this, but there are three main categories that I have, uh, that I think that should be included. And that physical aspect of accessibility, the digital access or the technological aspect and the cultural. So if we talk about the physical accessibility, it's not enough a user with a wheelchair just can barely get to the building. Yeah, you know, call us, give us a like, call and we find this guy who can take you through that back door somehow and push you through the building. That's not physical accessibility. We, uh, uh, but then even, even if there is a ramp for people to get next to the stairs that they can get to the building, there is a lot more into physical accessibility. You know, can the, uh, a person who blind also attend different uh, events and, and happenings. You know, if there is a meeting room or a, uh, yeah, a meeting room that is not accessible for a person who is with wheelchair or this, yeah, some, some other room that's not accessible. That, those, that building is not yet accessible. So there are lots of aspects on that. Uh, what are, what, what about the events that are happening? outside of the office building, are those accessible? Is there enough knowledge of the accessibility that we have in the websites and, and so on? Or do people who need this constantly have to come and ask, hey, by the way, did you remember us? Did you remember, do we have any accessibility? You know, that knowledge should be there. That don't, we shouldn't put that pressure on their shoulders to come and ask us, do we have this or not? And of course, the physical accessibility is also about the signages. What about finding a room in this whole building? Like, uh, are there braille signages? Are there any, uh, you know, uh, large print signages that people can use as well? So, uh, lots of uh, different, uh, smaller also areas in that aspect have the technological accessibility. I was very surprised to read that uh, when he, there has been a research to show that we feel that people exclude us from something, we get disappointed and, and, and of course, like uh, we might feel angry, we might feel sad and, and so on. But when people realize that they are being excluded, by computers, by programs, they are even more angry. There has been a research done so that people, the participant, research participants say that like, well, you kind of expect people to let you down. You don't really expect perfection from humans, but computers should work. Computers should exclude me. So when we do hire a person, but then, oh, well, you know, this app doesn't work and that app doesn't work. And let's, you know, well, it's okay. You can just give your, uh, you know, your uh, password, username and password to me and I can enter the data for you there. And, you know, just write this information on a Word document and give it to me, I can enter it. And like, or then, you know, oh, we have a meeting and all the agenda is in a picture, you know? so. These are not. Uh, th th these are not okay. There can be temporary workarounds. That's okay. That's understandable. You know, sometimes okay. Now we know that this is not working. Let's work for solving. But they shouldn't be a, um, a long-term solution. There shouldn't be that. Like, oh well, we have this solution. You know, it's working like this. So you have to kind of get along with that anyway. So technological, all the tools and things that we need to use, they need, we need to work for making them accessible. And then cultural. This is uh, the biggest thing that actually affects the two previous ones, because if we don't improve the cultural access, cultural side of the accessibility in our organization, in our workplace, uh, moving forward in the physical and technological accessibility is going to be hard. It's going to be that like people are going to like, I have so many other things to do. I Do I really, do we really have that many people with disability here? Do we really need to work on this? People need to understand access 
responsibility is not an extra uh, like feel good, do good, let's be charitable thing. Accessibility is that accessibility is a user, uh, the user experience, and user is user. Doesn't matter what kind of you know do they do the screen reader or not. And we've said that for years, but we are still like not doing that in uh, in action, right? So uh, talking about being clear in our mess in our in our uh, communications that. We value accessibility, this is important, and con continue to do that and not just let things sleep and okay, well, this person said this and it's okay for now, you know, like just really addressing these things. Uh, uh, talking about um, strategies that will be put and really follow up with them. And it's not okay to just like, oh, well, this is not, not, not working for, that, for now and let it be. Uh, for a few whom you haven't done, haven't had the experience of being with people with disabilities, we are not that scary yet, uh, you know. You can talk to us, you can ask us questions. The best thing is to ask, talk, and I promise that we would be kind and, you know, like just let you know what's right to say, what's not good to say. and and. The best thing, we wouldn't know each other if we don't talk to each other, if we don't ask questions. We need to communicate. Otherwise, this world is going to be just further from each other all the time. This world is going to be harder for all of us. Uh, you, people with disability, employees with disability are beneficial to the company the same way as any other employee. And they, they need to feel that. They need to know that. They need their needs. This needs to be clear to them. Lastly, let's include each other. Let's include everybody because we need each other, not because it's just a good thing to do. Again, uh, just because there is maybe more of us who can see well here, or there is more of us who can walk, that doesn't mean mean that there are those are more important or somehow the right ones, and then the others are the special ones. We all have needs, we all have human beings, and we all need each other. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> as a fellow 35-year-old who is still a child for adulthood to hit, I felt that. Okay, next up, uh, we have the questions and answers panel. So again, now is your chance to enter any questions. Um, we'll get the Madonna mic <laughs> set up um, and put here our panel set up. Uh, so just bear with us a few minutes uh, that we get it set it up. And in the meantime, Please do submit any questions you might have for any individual speaker or for all of them. Now is your chance to ask all those tough questions or questions about aspects that uh, were just mentioned in the talks. So one, one moment and we'll get this set up. Okay. 
just a hint. Okay. All right, are you ready? Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, I'll, I'll ask a question and then, then I'll hand the microphone. So we'll give the audio to everyone uh, watching online as well. Okay, uh, we have a few questions. You can still submit any questions you might have during this as well. Let's start with, what is the main blocker in improving accessibility in society? What do you think needs to change the most? Who wants to start? Well, for me, I, I feel that it's just, that's, that's what I was talking about as well, that this Understanding this this culture of uh, understanding that accessibility is that extra thing. You know, we have everything fine. Oh no, it's not accessible. No, it's uh, you know, if it's not accessible, it's not fine. So just that that accessibility is not the extra, you know, icing on top of the cake. I agree. I think it's about just not being aware. And you all can kind of now spread the message about how important it is to include everyone. So it's that inclusion. Um, and I, I don't think people are deliberately being you know, rude or not knowing, just not knowing that, okay, there are problems. Well, I, I kind of said it in my presentation, if the law the law that needs to change because when I go to I mean well as you heard I, I do a lot of stuff internationally if I go to Germany if I go to US if I go to uh, Great Britain uh, to, to UK uh, I can trust that there that accessibility works and if it doesn't I will get uh, uh compensation the and and the, the inaccessible um, place or service will get uh, sanctions for that and they will make it right though though i though that's what we need that's what a society needs we need rules we need sanctions we need uh we need uh and and yeah the legacy has to be strict it has to be it has to be clear and it has to be quite detailed to make sure that things are uh, done right. let's then continue with the legislation because i know this got uh, some of our speakers a bit heated up earlier um, but what do you think will happen when the European Accessibility Act comes in force? You want to um, continue? Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay, I'll say, well, nothing probably. This is just me being realistic. Um, 2025 summer, um, we know that the summer things can be clear and can be done properly. It's mainly about the like e-commerce digital services, it's more unknown for those products, like smashes with the digital environment plus, but they are products. So um, we know that those specs are not yet there. So how can um, companies prepare anything? I don't know. That seems a bit hard. But for e-commerce e sector, you know, the same rules apply that for, for the digital services now. So don't know. That shouldn't be excuse. That's my version of this. This you. Yeah, I guess the pessimistic part of me think, or the realistic part of me thinks that probably nothing much, because I don't 
that, you know, that things is going to happen suddenly, you know, on, on, in the summer 2025. Like, if those things are going to change, we need to start now. So, you know, like something like the, mm, the self uh, pay, what was that called? Like the self service machines in the shops, they take years to develop. So, they need, or, and then also like to get them in the shops and everything. So, if, you know, they are not going to be probably in 2025 any, any big changes. So, but I, I hope that at least some parts are a bit faster, like some of the, bigger like uh, work uh, web shops and so on but i don't know uh, 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 thank you for the question it's very good um the digital accessibility legislation it, uh, i mean that that went wrong because the finland had time to to make sure that everybody would know New directive and uh, uh, implement it as they should. And uh, but 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 they but Finland didn't do that. Finland didn't inform. Finland didn't take it as a part of our own uh, own legislation as they as we should have. Uh, a lot of depend. Uh, a lot about this depends a lot uh, on the next coalition. And um, I'm a bit hopeful uh, about that because um, I'm very politically active. So I'm not uh, trying to make any campaigns here, but I have to say that Kokomo has made a very, very clear statement about the importance of accessibility because they want to get people to work. And, and therefore, I'm quite hopeful actually about that they will also take this uh, the direct, uh, the, uh, directive seriously and adopt it in the Finnish Federation. I mean, in the Finnish uh, law. So, uh, what can actually change uh, can be very positive and a very good thing is if uh, the, uh, it will be adopted. But the directive unfortunately leaves a lot uh, for the member countries, the member states to consider and therefore that is not going to make do any magic unless if the coalition and the uh, parliament decides to adopt the, uh, the principles of that. Yes, so one hopeful and few realists. Um, so maybe next one, um, slightly related. So do you consider that accessibility is a priority topic for companies in Finland? And what would you do to get the topic recognized as important? <laughs> I see some shaking of heads. <laughs> Anyone want to start? Yeah, well, it depends a lot on the companies. I've worked with, have worked with a lot of different companies and projects and sectors and private sectors. It depends a lot. Some have been much more active, uh, and then some, unfortunately, you know, much less. It's just like, well, there is this law, and we have to do something. Can you just write some accessibility statement there, and we, you know, aren't we done now? So, it, it a lot depends. Uh, for me, it's a lot more about just trying to keep calm <laughs> and remind people that you know our needs, uh, all like all of our needs are important, the same amount, uh, and accessibility just means to be inclusive and think of everybody's needs, not just one group. But yeah, that changes a lot between between different organizations and companies. We hear a lot of um, like bing bangs, like companies just like, yeah, accessibility and, and, and so on. But unfortunately, like I would say a company 
is doing accessibility, then I go and use their products and it's accessible. You know, if they are making big noises, and I'm talking about some of very well-known tools that we use every day, they can make as many noises as they want. When I have to wait a year before I can start using their uh, product with my screen reader, I wouldn't say that accessibility is their priority. I have to agree. Um, it just, well, it's not there. Even the public sector websites or the services are not really accessible. Something is always wrong there. PDFs are not working, applications, you can't send applications or, or whatever. So, priority, you no, know, it's more like an, you know, irritation to them. Mm, it's a shame because, like, I would like to have the companies think like a green IT. It's so sexy to think about you know, how you make everything green, why it's accessible and all that kind of thing. And I, I did try to make a point about customer experience. It doesn't matter. You don't want customers. Is that the thing? Clearly. Yeah, it, it depends on the co on a company I said here, like before. So, so we cannot really say only one thing about all companies or all, all the um, private sector. Uh, I have seen them very ambitious uh, companies, and especially the companies who need very, very highly educated uh, people, uh, specialists, like, for example, Orion, who need biochemists who are really, uh, who are really specialized in some medication, and, and who uh, they have to fight for the international workforce, and because uh, those people, those those very few people who they can uh, fight for, who they can uh, uh, hire in those positions, they might be disabled people. So that's why they have very high, high standard of accessibility because they cannot afford uh, passing. Uh, I mean. Um, just uh, uh, letting those people not to come to work for them. They they want to attract be uh, uh, specialists. But on but, but then companies who feel that they, they they don't need to think about it. They don't do they don't do that. And that's why we would need uh, the legislation that talking about to make sure that it would happen and uh, that that would make and also that kind of legislation would uh, make it possible also for companies to to make structures make better structures in order to raise money and stuff like that for accessibility because now there are no demands the, the law uh, doesn't require anything, so they cannot get support for accessibility. Because, in, for example, in Germany, that, that I have mentioned a lot, they have a strict law, but they also have like support, like grants for uh, companies to make it more accessible. So it works like both ways. Okay, let's <clears throat> switch gears a bit um, into, so if you could change one thing in how people talk about accessibility, what would it be? Um, there's also a specific question about a term, label or term to uh, a group of people who are not disabled or don't live with a disability. What is that term? Uh, obviously it's not normal but um there's uh, this person posing the question says they've been using not yet disabled people so uh, any thoughts or comments <laughs> on that as well and 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 what would you change if about talking about accessibility Do we well first of all uh even all uh, disabled people talk nicely about accessibility. Uh, this is not a, a commonly shared 
uh, view. I mean, because I, I work in a project uh, where we uh, interview activists. I mean, it's about disability activism, and, and not even all those people are in favor of these laws that I'm talking about. They just feel like they don't want to be too difficult. Um, I, uh, I know a lot of architects, so I, I talk a lot about uh, the accessibility with architects because I have been married to one, and that's why I have a lot of friends who are architects. And um, um, and so we talk a lot about this, and they are also, of course, key people when it comes to accessibility, because they are the one who design uh, buildings. And I like the architects who say that uh, this is something very important and something very possible, because <laughs> I think that um, why accessibility uh, is often ignored is that it's seen something very difficult, something like impossible to do. I don't like the architects who say that this is completely um, uh, uh, like unrealistic and that kind of kills the, the whole uh, conversation. So uh, yeah, I wish that we would see possibilities here instead of like Mm, problems, challenges, and and waste of money as that I also hear a lot. And I would also say that uh, when it comes to political level, I wish that we would talk about accessibility more as a human right instead of charity or goodwill. I like kind of cold accessibility. No, no, no good feelings, no good will, just accessibility. I'm going to continue with that around. I don't like that we actually have to have a legislation. It just doesn't make sense to me because at the moment the legislation actually says, oh, you're that kind of organization, you don't know how to care about accessibility. So it's just kind of like immediately creates these groups, that, you know, technically doesn't need to care. Um, I don't have um, what, about accessibility. What, what was the question? Anyway, uh, I'm quite, uh, uh, I would talk about equality and the rights to, to, you know, I should be able to do the same things as, you know, you want to do or vice versa. So that should be the main thing. One thing I want to say, I think we all are, more or less able-bodied or whatever to some extent i mean you can have a bad day and then you have to do something and you just stare at the screen and like oh i have no idea what i'm supposed to do here so you might be in disadvantages because you're not feeling sharp enough today to do something it's because the website is not designed the way that it's easy to use and Oh, the kids are screaming in the background. I have to do this today because the deadline is now. Um, it's about making sure that you know everyone can do something despite their level of what that is. So I think we all less well, not in the same level of maybe, but the the kind of the principle is we never know, you know, you know, some things are invisible, the things that you know you don't know what what's going on in everyone's life. But that's my point. Yeah, I think one thing that I would change about how we talk about accessibility is that actually talk about accessibility a bit more. Like, uh, you know, we, I, many times we just don't want to talk about it and we don't talk about it enough. About accessibility, about people with disability, about inclusion, uh, how many movies in our television is about a person with disability living a norm, so-called normal life? You know, being a mother, being a wife, being a father, a person with any type of disabilities. How many of our games have a person with disability as a character in them? 
How many of our kids learn that you can be, have a disability and live a life, you know? So just let's talk, let's be like to know each other. Let's get, fix this gap that is between us. Uh, the, how I talk about people who, uh, well, are not uh, disabled or don't have a disability usually depends a lot on the context. So where I'm talking about, uh, many times I just, uh, especially at my work, I just said sighted users in in uh, you know uh, face, uh, faces the non-sighted users or like visually impaired users. Uh, or like mouse users rather than keyboard users or keyboard only users. Uh, sometimes I have used the word typical just because usually there is, you know, in any room there is more like, for example, uh, people who don't have a visual impairment rather than have, but I also don't like it very much, but it depends on the context and the situation I have used it. Uh, for me, I think the most important thing is to put the uh, the emphasis on the people, on the person. So person with disability, person without disability. I'm not going to shout at people every time they say disabled persons or disabled users. That's okay to use sometimes. But as long as uh, culturally, we do understand that we are talking about users, about people. These people can have a disability and can have not and might have a disability in the future. I don't want to scare people, but all of us are getting there at some point anyway. Thank you. I think we're unfortunately running out of time, but I'll I'll ask one last question and let's let's end on a positive note. Um, so there's a question of oh, well, let's see <laughs> about our realists. Um, so uh, has what has been an occasion where you have felt and experienced that the accessibility um, of an event service? Uh, a digital service has been to a good standard and that you have really been included. Um, <laughs> a tough one. Do you need a moment? Okay, let's go. Uh, I have felt included when when uh, I became a mom because uh, this uh, Finnish society kind of appreciates motherhood so much that it kind of all the other, all, all kinds of different of, of people, it just appreciates you as mother. And, and, and in, in a way that was like really nice, but that was also the first time when anyone in the uh, healthcare personnel said anything nice about my body. Uh, but anyway, like... Um, I guess... It's really difficult to answer that question because when you are included, you don't really think about it. You don't have to think about it. But there you just are, as you, uh, uh, and, and you think about the occasion. Uh, because that gives me, like in a meeting, for example, when I'm chairing a meeting, which I do a lot, I never think about if I'm included or not in this, this situation. I just think about the agenda of the meeting and about the issues. And I think that's the way it is supposed to be. And I guess that's how people mostly feel. They don't think whether they want to, whether they are included or not, but just do things. And I, I guess that's why it's so difficult to 
to think about some occasion. Uh, maybe one of my very first experiences and memories from coming to Finland and when I to University of Joensuu in Eastern Finland to do my master degree. And I come from, the, as I said, I did my bachelor in, uh, in Iran uh, and I had a lot of experiences of people, because I was studying software engineering, everyone was like, what? Like, you are telling me that you don't see and you like a developer or studying computer science or studying software engineering. I had a lot of experiences of really trying to fight for, yes, I can be here, you know, let me see, I can do this and, and, and so on. Uh, and I came to Finland, it was one of the very first weeks, I was sitting in the, one of the corridors in the university waiting for a teacher uh, that I was supposed to meet. Uh, in the same like kind of corner, there was sitting another person and they started talking. At some point I realized that she's one of the uh, teachers in the university. So she talked to me about like, what are you doing here? And I told her that I just started here doing my master. And she was, a, she was a, like a professor like in the teaching uh, uh, like department. So she kind of like talked to me and it was very interested. Like, oh, I have never seen a blind person studying like software engineering or computer science and ask me question, how do you do this and how do you do that and, and so on. And then at the end, she turned to me and said, I think we are so lucky that you came here to study so we can learn how to teach a person computer science who cannot see. And I wanted to hug her and I was crying because it's like, I never felt that, you know, that me being there is somebody else's chance. Not nobody has thought about it like that before. So I do want to say I am a realistic. This is an experience of like seven years of fighting with stations and, and uh, you know, trying to make for working for priority in companies with the accessibility and so on, this realistic view. But I do, I do, I have had lots of also positive experiences here and, and in many other places as well. Oh, I, don't, I don't have anything well, included. I don't know, it's just, hmm, I don't know. Sometimes it can be a different kind of exclusion, what you feel. Yeah, but I'm just really happy to hear that, you know, sometimes what you experience is not seen as a, you know, it's seen as a good thing. Like, a, oh, you're one of those, what can we do for you now? Headache. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, um, I want to say that the people I work with, um, there's a lot of things that people to say that oh wow they must be really resilient and all that sort of thing and I think they feel and I feel as well that well what can you do they kind of have to so it's just one of those things thank you thank you so much I think that our panel and uh, thanks thanks to all of our fantastic speakers let's give it up to them And, and then final words for us um, organizers, but it's quite hard to say anything after Asara's last point, uh, goosebumps have to say. So first of all, thank you all, our speakers and panelists today, and our lovely Helmi also, she's awake, I, I assume, and all our guests here and online but few uh, points from our point of view because we as a company individuals we have been working with different organization and, and companies during the last 20 years uh, building their digital services and products and we have also some learnings i'm not gonna go 
uh, burden you with the, anything academical, but few uh, points here. Yeah, I think the the speeches today actually point out quite well that yes, accessibility is our social responsibility, and yes, there is legislation coming, and learning from from past experience about GDPR. Uh, organization should act now when there is time and not when when the deadline is yes tomorrow or or even sooner and uh, the sooner the better but i want to always uh, highlight to our clients that accessibility is also a good business there there is a business aspect, uh, aspect to it also and that we've learned when doing those those uh, numerous amount of projects with our clients well, it's a simple math that accessibility, when you when you invested in it, it can extend your product's market reach. It's a yes, simple math because when you reach, um, when you do products that are you know to everybody, different disabilities, you have more people to target, then you get more people to your uh, customers, and with that you can actually increase your uh, competitive advantage because not that many organizations or um, companies uh, you showed us example that you know there the world is not perfect so when you as a uh, company an organization take the step forward or two steps forward compared to your competitors then there you have it you have the advantage and yes, the accessibility can take your brand to a whole new level, meaning that when you send out a message uh, to your audience that you actually do care about inclusivity and, and accessibility, then that is a good for your brand also. Uh, a, a beautiful statement from my colleague in Berlin um, yes, accessibility is a long-term commitment. It's not one time that you do and you're done with it. It is about, uh, about the processes that you develop your services. It's about know-how. It's about training. It's something that you do constantly. But accessibility is most usable. It increases site performance. It does address the needs of, of your users, and it is an opportunity not a threat. With these words, I want to welcome you if you happen to visit Berlin, uh, 6th of July. <laughs> there is a, uh, we have, because we have this uh, series of events about accessibility, we have third one there, but if you're not able to travel to Berlin, <laughs> uh, then you can join online and hear more. I don't know yet the details of that event, but we will uh, we will know that on, on social media so far, LinkedIn. Thank you all. Thank you. Our speakers, audience here and there, and, 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 and Joel and Bia for all, all the arrangements. Thank you. Have a good evening.